Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll learn to become a better, more business-savvy designer so you can dominate your competition. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and I'm super excited to say that this episode of Design Domination marks one year since I started the podcast. (laughs) Thank you for all the time that you've spent listening to my episodes. I really hope that you've gotten a lot out of them. And if you have, please be sure to leave a review in iTunes. In this episode, I'm going to talk all about pricing. Do you know what to consider when pricing your work? Are you charging enough for your work? Do you worry if your price was right after you sent an estimate? There are so many ways to figure out how to price a project and how you do so and present it can affect how the client perceives the value. Either you will be perceived as an expert and command respect, or you risk being seen as not understanding or underestimating the scope of the work, and then your work being perceived as low quality. I'm going to address 12 pricing mistakes to avoid so you can be more profitable, and some of these came from questions that I got in the Design Domination Facebook community. And if you're not a member of that yet, please come join us. Mistake number one is not knowing if you're profitable. Now, to be profitable, you don't need to charge big bucks, okay? But when it comes to pricing, you should first figure out the minimum that you need to charge in order to cover your expenses. Taxes, insurance, software and subscriptions, phone and internet, courses and memberships, and so forth. Then you need to calculate a minimum hourly rate. Elise Benin of Marketing Mentor has a great resource called Overhead and Hourly Rate Worksheet, and that will help you realize what you need to consider for all of this. And that worksheet is available for download free of charge, and the link is in the show notes. Doing this helps you establish a baseline. You should know what your baseline is so you can get paid enough to cover your time and expenses and make a profit. Without understanding these figures, though, you won't know how much to price to be profitable. And if you're not profitable, why bother doing the work? I mean, you won't be freelancing very long if the work costs you more than you get paid. Having said that, though, just because you figure out a baseline hourly rate does not mean that you should charge hourly. And that brings me to mistake number two, which is charging hourly for creative work. I think it's good to estimate for your own reference the number of hours that you think a project will take you. Plus, it's helpful to track your time on projects because it helps you estimate similar work in the future, and it helps you understand if you're becoming more efficient over time as well, and that just means you make more money in less time. But charging a client by the hour has only one advantage I can think of, and that is when the scope is not well-defined. And in that case, charging an hourly rate ensures that you'll get paid for all your time. Now, a paid discovery session for a flat rate with the client could resolve that, and that would actually position you as an expert, gaining you more respect and more money, but that's a topic for another episode. There are so many disadvantages to pricing work on an hourly basis, okay? One, you only get paid for your time. You don't get paid for your creativity, your expertise, or the value of the work. Two, if you work quickly, you're being punished by getting paid less, and I mean, shouldn't you get paid more if you're more efficient and can deliver faster? Hello. (laughs) Three is that it can position you poorly and give off and even encourage a nickel and diming vibe in some cases. Four is it can cause sticker shock. If you never estimated a range of hours along with your rate, the client may end up with sticker shock when they receive the final invoice. You know, they might have assumed in their head that it would be X number of hours instead of Y. Unfortunately, in these cases, the designer is the one who unjustifiably sucks it up and then reduces the invoice to meet the client's expectations, you know, to please them only so they can get more unprofitable work from them in the future. And then the last point is you usually don't do your best work because you're focused on time and staying within the range of hours that you conveyed to the client, if you did that. Now, a lot of clients will request estimates based on your hourly rate. Forget it, especially if it's for creative work, where you're getting paid for your ideas or if it's non-creative work that you're really efficient at. I mean, again, should you get paid less for doing work more efficiently? So if you need to, just say that you don't have an hourly rate or you don't price work that way. 
And on that note, you don't need to reveal the breakdown of your pricing, you know, how you arrived at that figure, how many hours you might have taken into consideration, because, well, I've been asked that before, but it's simply none of their business. Now, ironically, a lot of clients don't realize that hourly rates hurt them too, okay? One is they're writing a blank check unless you have provided them an estimated number of hours with your hourly rate. You know, they don't know how much they're going to be investing in the project. And then the second point is they won't get a better result if you or they are focused on hours. In some cases, such as branding, I mean, you can't rush that. And in other cases, you know, rush work should cost more, <laughs> not less. Let's look at an example here. A more advanced designer might charge $60 an hour and take 20 hours to get something done. Okay. And a beginner designer might charge $20 an hour and take 80 hours to get the same job done. In this situation, just speaking in terms of monetary costs alone, the more advanced designer costs less while the beginner costs more by $400. Okay. So the advanced designer at $60 an hour times 20 hours is $1,200. And the beginner designer charging $20 an hour and taking 80 hours, you know, is at $1,600. Most of the time, clients shopping around based on hourly rates don't take that into consideration, so they often go with the lower rate. But that's fine. We don't want those clients. Now, that example doesn't even speak to the quality of the work, okay? So let's assume that the designer who charges less per hour doesn't do as good a job as the advanced designer. Is it worth it to the client to spend $400 more to get higher quality work? You know, maybe, maybe not. Or would they rather waste time redoing the entire process later with a second designer, which costs them more money and more time? Let's look at an example with a logo design. If you come up with a brilliant logo design in 15 minutes, is it suddenly worth less? No. If it takes you 10 days, is it worth more? No. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? Now, should the client pay you more if it takes you a long time to come up with an idea? No. <laughs> so pricing work by the hour punishes you for working faster and it reinforces that time for money mindset to the client instead of expertise, okay? And it can leave the client wondering how much they're even going to spend. Mistake number three is charging all clients the same. Now, in cases such as branding work, the size of the client matters because well-known brands have more at stake and they also have more to gain as well. And they also usually expect to pay for that. Just think if Target approached you for a new logo design. What do you think they pay for that? Tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe, right? If they approached you for pricing and you said $500 or $1,500 because that's what you're used to charging, I mean, wouldn't that sound silly? They expect to pay more because they understand the value. So your pricing would be out of alignment with their expectations. Many large brands sell merchandise with their logo on it. I mean, we've all seen that. It's the reason that millions of people, you know, spend all this money on it. It's for what the merchandise says about them, the consumer. The value that consumer perceives is enhanced. I mean, think about Louis Vuitton and Tesla as examples. I mean, to the consumer, it's no longer, you know, just a suitcase or just a car. It's the statement it makes. Size can also play a factor when companies or organizations, well-known or not, have a lot of employees. In terms of branding, they need a more extensive brand guide so they know how to maintain the integrity of the new branding across multiple offices. I know the next question is going to be, well, how do I know how much they make or how do I know how big they are? You can sometimes find out how big a company or organization is in terms of employees and their revenue by checking their annual reports. Another thing you can do is for nonprofits, you can check on GuideStar. And for businesses, you can search on manta.com. Mistake number four is not demonstrating the benefits of the work. When a client needs an estimate, most designers are just going to say, oh, you need a brochure? Okay, it's this much. But if before starting a project, you're asking questions such as, what are you looking to achieve? What are your goals? then you instill confidence in the client because you're showing that you care about their business and you're not just providing an estimate, you're taking the lead. You know, you're being the chef, not the short order cook. And if you're unsure what questions to ask a client in a design meeting, download my free guide, 
17 questions you must ask during a design consultation at creative-boost.com. So when presenting your estimate or proposal, you want to include details of what the client will be getting, meaning the benefits and the results of the work. Don't just present an estimate with the project name and price like everyone else. Tie in the benefits of the work to the results, such as design a logo that makes the client appear more modern and relevant in the industry to help them increase sales. You know, if that's what they told you they were, they're trying to do, increase sales. Let's say they're a large company and you can help them increase their sales by 10%. Well, you know, if you go check out what, what their revenue is like, you mean, what's that worth to them? The point is to demonstrate that the value of what you're offering, what they're getting, is so much more than what they're paying. How many more sales will they make as a result of that? You know, you're justifying your worth. You're justifying your fees. They will stop seeing you as just a designer and start seeing you as a marketing expert, a business expert, you know, or a trusted consultant. Mistake number five is selling quantity over quality. When it comes to the number of designs, some clients may request, or you might specify, a set number of designs. You may also specify the included number of rounds of revisions or time for revisions. Those are really good to define the scope well, so it's clear if and when the work exceeds that. I always like to say up to X number of designs, because usually there's a front runner when you're trying out different ideas, you know, that one design that really stands out. And you don't want to present, you know, three just to present three. You know, then you've got two good ones and a crappy one just to fulfill that number that you promised. <laughs> I also say up to for revisions, because <laughs> I've actually had a client tell me that they had one round of revisions left after they had just rewritten an entire brochure. And that was completely nonsensical. They actually felt like they were getting more of their money's worth by finding more edits to make. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> now, if you're designing a website, the number of different pages that you might have to design for would be a factor in pricing. You know, you've got the home page, maybe a blog, a landing page, etc. And so the more pages are going to add to the cost of the work. And by the way, in this case, you'd only need to present the initial designs for the home page and then create the other ones later once the home page design is approved, as opposed to, you know, providing multiple designs for each one up front. Mistake number six is not charging for native files. Oh, I see this all the time. When it comes to deliverables, does the client want low and high res PDFs? You know, something they can post on their website and then something they can print. You know, or are they asking for native files? Now, if it's a logo, of course they should get the native files as part of the work. But for all other types of work, charge for those native files separately or build it into the price. I've charged anywhere from 30% to 100% of the fee. Some designers and agencies just hand them over, but unless it's a work for hire or, you know, it's government work, then you have every right to charge for these files. You know, they're your tools and they contain proprietary information. I mean, you wouldn't ask a contractor to come and build you a deck and then ask that he leave his saw and hammer. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you paid for the service, the act of building a deck, you know, not the tools. Mistake number seven is not charging for rush work. The schedule for the project can definitely be a factor in pricing. Is it a rush? Do you need to work the same day? Do you need to be on call all day in case of any last minute changes? I mean, I've ha actually had that happen. That ended up being more than the actual work. <laughs> so charge for that, you know, charge a day rate of several hundred or a thousand bucks, you know, in addition to the work that needs to be done. I mean, after all, you're making yourself available at their beck and call and possibly turning away other work to do so. Mistake number eight is not valuing your expertise. Expertise could be in terms of the quality of your work. It could be any specialized knowledge you may have, or it could be results that you get for your clients. Okay, so let's cover quality first. Is the quality of your work higher than that of other designers? You know, do you pay attention to details such as double checking edits that you make for the client so that they don't have to babysit and tell you you missed a spot? <laughs> well, that saves them time and it can save them the cost of outputting new proofs, reprinting a job, and it keeps them on their delivery schedule. That all has a lot of value. 
Maybe your designs usually hit the nail on the head nine times out of 10 because you ask really good questions up front, do the necessary research, and only then start designing. That serves their needs well and it saves time. That also has a lot of value. Specialization. So let's say you specialize in a certain type of work such as logo design or publication design. If you're a specialist, charge more for that. It's your unique expertise. Specialists charge more than generalists, generally speaking. No pun intended. <laughs> Think of it in terms of the medical field. You know, a specialist charges more than a general practitioner, right? Why? Well, they may have completed more years of study in a certain area, and they deal with just that specialization every single day. Okay, here's another example. My husband builds performance transmissions. They're not for everyday cars. They're for muscle cars for people who want to race, you know, or who have street rods. Recently, someone asked the company that he works for for an estimate for transmission work on their Mustang. This person also got an estimate from a local general transmission company that's part of a national chain. Well, the estimate from my husband's company was more than that of the general transmission company. My husband reviewed their estimate and told the guy, this estimate includes parts you don't even need for building this transmission, and it leaves out two parts you definitely need. Because my husband's company does this work 100% of the time, they are specialists and have a better understanding of the work involved. This generalist company doesn't do this all the time, and therefore they weren't even aware their estimate had discrepancies. So this higher estimate, and I'm putting quotes around higher, by my husband's company is accurate and the other one isn't. That company's lack of expertise in this area would end up costing the customer more money and more time. You know, in ordering parts they hadn't anticipated, waiting for those parts to arrive, taking apart the transmission and putting it together a second time maybe. So if you have expertise with a certain type of work or even experience in a certain industry, especially a very narrow niche, and you understand the needs of clients in that industry, you should charge for that. You're bringing that knowledge with you. You've already unknowingly done some of the work, even though it came with the territory of past projects and wasn't, you know, active time that you sat and researched it or went to school for. You acquired that knowledge through your experience, and you can help clients in that industry more than a designer who does not have that knowledge. The story of Picasso and drawing a woman's portrait is a good example to illustrate that. Oh, no pun intended. <laughs> a woman wanted him to draw her portrait, okay? And he agreed. And after he studied her a bit, he drew a single pencil stroke and then handed over the sketch. She said it was perfect and he had captured her essence with that one stroke. Then she asked how much she owed him and he replied $5,000. So the woman's like, how could you possibly charge that much when it only took you a second to do it? And he said, Madame, it took my entire life. Another factor to consider in terms of expertise is how your work has helped clients. Make it a regular practice to follow up with clients and ask them what results they got from the work. Sometimes they'll tell you and sometimes they won't. Sometimes they have no idea. <laughs> you can ask them, you know, if you did event design work, did they get more attendees to their event this year? You know, did they get more sales or donations after you redesigned their site? You know, maybe they can tell you a percentage. And then with their permission, include those results on your website and in all of your proposals. You know, that helps justify your rates because, for example, a client isn't looking for quote unquote event materials. You know, they're looking for how those event materials are going to help them. Mistake number nine is lacking confidence. I see a lot of designers who want to charge more, you know, maybe 5000 not 500 for a logo. There are a few factors that can affect this. One, it could be a marketing issue, meaning you're attracting clients who don't see the value in a logo at that price point. Second, it could be a positioning problem, meaning how you're presenting yourself on your website and social media. I go into a lot of detail about this in episode 21, which is client relationships are like dating. But what I think is the reason for some designers not getting more money for their work in many cases is the lack of confidence. 
Lack of confidence often comes from fear, and a lot of time fear comes from what's worked in the past. So you might tell yourself, I can't charge $5,000 for a logo because I've only been paid $1,000 for that in the past. But that's irrelevant. Perhaps your work has improved. Maybe you ask better questions now. You have more to offer than you did then. So don't let your mindset hold you back. You must believe in yourself and your work and how it helps clients. If you don't believe it, they won't either. Without confidence, you won't be excited when you talk about your work and how it's helped other clients, right? When you have confidence, it instills confidence in the client. You might know you can do the work and do it well, but you've got to have confidence when talking about the work. And that means your pricing too. I speak from experience. I can look back and see how lack of confidence, or at least conveying my confidence to the client, held my business back years ago. Imposter syndrome all the way. (laughs) But participating in online groups and forums and writing and sharing blog posts helped combat this because I saw that others were learning from what I was sharing just as I was learning from them. You know, we take for granted how much we really know. When you share with others what you know, you will quickly realize how much you do know because people will ask you questions or tell you how much they've learned. And that just justifies your expertise. Mistake number 10 is pricing too low. Pricing too low has a plethora of disadvantages. First, you will alienate your ideal clients who are shopping based on value, not price, and who expect to pay for it. So your work will be perceived to be low value. Second, low pricing may come across as Hmm, this designer doesn't understand all that's involved. I had that happen once. A prospect had gotten three estimates, one from me and the others from larger agencies. They loved my work, so they decided to ask me for an explanation about my pricing, you know, saying it was much lower than the other two. Well, of course, I didn't have any information about the other two estimates or what they included in them, but I told them, you know, I had very low overhead and I could keep my rates competitive but it didn't matter. That's not how they saw it. They didn't think I understood the work, which I totally did and made a case for, but they expected to pay more for it. And because my pricing was too low, I didn't get the work. Third, pricing too low often results in you not doing your best work and resenting the client, even though it's not their fault that you underestimated the work. Fourth, when you compete on price, not value, not your special skills or insights, It's always a race to the bottom. Folks, there is no winner in that race. There is always someone willing to do it cheaper. And what is the point of quote unquote winning the work only to be unprofitable? Mistake number 11 is not talking money up front. When you talk money up front on the call, it not only shows you're a professional, but it can help you screen the client and see if they're even worth pursuing. The project that they are requesting may not even be possible to be done at that price. For example, I once had a medical professional contact me to ask for a slide presentation to be designed. For what she described, I told her that similar work had been about $1,000. She said, oh, I thought it would cost $100. (laughs) Thankfully, I didn't spend any more time on that nonsense. (laughs) The other thing is that talking money up front can help you establish their expectations. If you ask for a budget and they refuse to provide that, you can ask expectation of cost. $500, $5,000, or $50,000. I mean, it's like them coming to you and asking for a car. Do they want a Kia or a Ferrari? Another option would be to say that it sounds like it would probably start at X amount. That usually ranges from blank to blank or similar work has run blank. You don't want to give a quote without having all the info. You're just feeling out the situation. Talking money up front also prevents the price from being a surprise in your estimate or proposal. Mistake number 12, reducing the price to meet client expectations. 
Just because a client claims they have no budget or they can't afford it does not mean there is a problem with your pricing or that you should lower it to meet their expectations. It will just appear as if your fee was inflated to begin with. If they can't afford it, you have a few options. Move on to the next client or ask them to get back in touch if they get the budget for it. I've actually had that happen, if you can believe it. (laughs) If it makes sense to, offer to do it in phases to spread out the work and their investment. Reduce the scope and as a result, the price. You never reduce the price without reducing the scope. (laughs) Consider reducing the price in exchange for a more lax schedule, especially if the project was going to have a tight schedule to begin with. One strategy I've used in the past that kind of gives me an out, a way I can reduce the price by reducing the scope, you know, if I wasn't sure of their budget, is to include more revisions or designs than usual. And if the client balked at the price, then I reduce the scope, I reduce the amount of designs or revisions along with the price. So after all this, how the heck do you figure out (laughs) what number to charge? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I hate to break it to you, but pricing is not an exact science. However, understanding all of these factors should help you come up with a price for your work. You can estimate, for your reference only, the time that you think it will take, plus account for time for managing the project, you know, answering emails, requesting proper files, invoicing, meetings, research, etc., And then add a few hours to that to account for anything that you didn't think of. And add some for profit, you know, usually about like 20%. And account for all the factors that I mentioned earlier. It's helpful to get to know a few other designers that you can bounce pricing off of from time to time. But understand that the scope of work, your skill level, your geographic area, and the client's industry are all factors in pricing. So just because someone else charges twice as much as you for a website design doesn't mean you're justified in doing that. On the other hand, just because they're charging less doesn't mean you shouldn't charge more. And keep in mind that there is a direct correlation between what you charge and the quality of client that you attract. Good clients understand the value and are usually low maintenance. The ones who are penny wise and pound foolish will mentally exhaust you, want to art direct, question your invoices, request too many revisions, and are just so high maintenance and difficult to work with. (laughs) Now, you may wonder whether or not you should include pricing on your website. Well, the advantage to this is that it can eliminate tire kickers, the ones that are shopping only on price. On the other hand, there are a couple disadvantages. One is your competition will see your pricing, and that could lead them to change their pricing to match yours. That's not to say, of course, that they offer work of similar value. And two, it could lead prospects to believe that their project, which may vary greatly in scope, will be similar in price. It's definitely something you can test out. And if you decide to, I think it's safest to use a phrase such as starting at blank, so you don't box yourself in. If you have a niche whose needs that you understand well, then package pricing can be effective and profitable. You can create packages around these needs, and it sets the expectations right away, and it eliminates time-consuming estimates and proposals. A colleague of mine created specific web design packages for a certain niche of crafters. She has a set WordPress theme that she uses that she customized to serve this specific audience. She can just drop in the brand elements and images, make a few tweaks, add the client's social media links, and then launch the site. It's very profitable for her because she spent time up front understanding that audience and putting in the time to create this productized service, which she can repeatedly make money from with little continued effort. But if you're offering, let's say, a branding package, and you're offering it to anyone and everyone as opposed to a certain type of client, then a larger company may come along and expect to pay that when they should be paying more. So I definitely think that when you serve a particular audience, you can do this more effectively. You can offer different levels of packages, and you can consider add-ons so that clients aren't boxed in 
no pun intended, (laughs) by a package that wouldn't meet their needs. So I want to leave you with this. It's important to remember that your goal is not to convert all prospects into clients. Your goal is not to win every single job. Not every client or job will be the right fit. That's okay. The goal is to be profitable and attract the right clients who will understand the value and happily pay your fees. The clients who see the work as an investment, not an expense. If you found this helpful, please leave a review and like and share it on social media. Join the Design Domination community on Facebook and go to creative-boost.com to download free resources and apply for design coaching.